All right, let's, let's do a review of um, chapter two, the first set of slides, and then after this we'll, we'll go on. All right, so I think that's a good idea. All right, so, you know, in the first chapter we, we discussed a very important concept called the instruction set architecture, and now we're moving into the instruction set. So uh, I think there's not much here to, to say. Um, we're going to use a particular um, computer ISA known as MIPS, and so its instruction set architecture, and therefore its instruction set will be important to us. Uh, there's data about it in your textbook, including a really nice summary of the instruction set on this green card. You, you really need to buy the book and get this green card, okay? So just, that's real important. You'll need it. And also the appendices B and E are very helpful. Okay, we all are familiar with the idea that in memory, the program is part of what's stored in memory and that the architecture of the computer fetches instructions from memory to, C to CPU, executes them, may g need data from I.O. or give data to I.O., but I.O. data is through memory also. So the memory becomes the central grand station between CPU traffic and I.O. traffic. So if the CPU needs to send something to I.O., it goes there and then out. If I.O. needs to give something to CPU, it goes there and then in. The heavy traffic is this right here, okay, memory CPU. Um, also, the concept of stored program is that what's in memory is ones and zeros, and the data ones and zeros just look a lot like the, the instruction ones and zeros. It's all there together. Data and code are stored together in a common memory. Okay, the ISA of, of MIPS, of course, has instructions in some different categories. Uh, computational will be arithmetic, uh, as well as some logic instructions. Loads and stores move things from memory into the CPU and move them back. If we move um, a, a data item into the CPU, where can we put it? The answer is in little memory called registers. So we have big memory, which holds a lot, and little memory, which holds very little. In fact, it only holds 32 uh, data items, but that's enough for the ones that we're commonly using. So we'll bring them up into the CPU. So loads and stores are just transfers from memory to CPU, from CPU to memory. Do you remember from the lesson which one brings into CPU and which one sends out to memory? Do you remember that? What's load do? Which direction is load? Right, from memory into CPU. So that means store is from CPU into memory. Okay, jumps on branches, those are for change of control. I'm sure we've all seen things like this that say, you know, uh, if A is equal to zero, yes, no, you know, one, zero. So what is that? It's an if. If A equals zero, do this. If not, do this. You have these in high-level languages. This is a graphical representation. We have to be able to test and branch or jump. Those are just change of control. In other words, instead of da, 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 sometimes we go, woo, and go to here. Change of control on jumps and branches. Floating point arithmetic with coprocessor may be necessary to do those special arithmetics, managing memory and some special categories of instructions. Nice thing about a simple instruction set architecture, it doesn't have a whole lot of formats. When we get to the Intel architecture, you're going to see it's got a lot of formats. We only have to worry about three formats. They're very simple. It's a 32-bit machine, so the instructions are 32 bits long. The opcode is six bits in all three cases. The opcode tells you what kind of instruction it is. Okay. After you know what kind of instruction it is, it needs operands. You can see here that three registers, two sources and a destination will be necessary if I'm going to do things like this. A equals B plus C because that's going to be probably something like R1 equals R2 plus R3. In other words, bring C in and put it there, bring B in and put it there, add them together and put it in R1 and then send it back to there. So these high level memory uh, location names, you know, variable names, translate, as you can see, to register names at the low level. So we do addition, and we do all our arithmetic and logic in processor. So we have a format for that, which takes two sources and a destination. We have a different format, which is a 16-bit intermediate if we need a number. And then we have a different format still if we have a very large amount, which we call the jump target address. We're going to jump to some place, and we need many bits for its address. So that's the basic. All are 32 bits, common instruction format. We call them the uh, R format for register instructions, the I format for immediate instructions, because this is called an immediate value, and the J format for jump instructions. Okay, now four design principles which are all through the RISC and MIPS design, and in fact are useful design principles for anything you'll do in life is, uh, if you want things to be simple, they should be regular. Regularity 
helps simplicity. Keeping things simple helps keep it regular. Uh, smaller is faster. That's just about physics. Things move in quicker if the distance is smaller. So you just make smaller instruction sets leads to smaller hardware. Smaller number of registers leads to smaller hardware. Smaller number of addressing modes leads to smaller hardware. Smaller hardware is faster hardware. That's, that's as simple as it, is, as it can get. Uh, making the common case fast, if you want things to go fast, then making something that happens 99% of the time be slow, but making something that happens 1% of the time be super fast is a waste of your time. You should instead focus on the 99% and try to speed it up, then you'll get an overall performance increase. So if you want to make things go fast, make the common case go fast, the things that you do often. Speed them up, you'll get a nice performance result. And finally, Good design always faces difficult problems. The solution to those difficult problems is often in a good compromise. A good way to put two competing forces together in a nice synthesis. Anybody know about a German philosopher named Hegel? You ever heard of anything? Heard of a guy named Hegel? Anybody taken any philosophy? Hegel's main idea, and it's pretty much, uh, I think, accepted, is that in the world of the evolution of ideas, there's an idea and then it finds a counter idea that says, no, 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 no. And the counter idea says, yeah, this is wrong, that's not right, da, 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 this is weak. And then the two ideas wrestle and fight until a, an emerged new idea happens, and it's the best of both. Okay? Kind of like this idea, a good compromise. In Hegel's philosophy, the idea is called the thesis. And the anti idea, the one that says, no, 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 is the antithesis. And putting the two together is called the synthesis. And the new resulting idea in Hegel's idea of evolution, his philosophy of evolution of ideas, is that becomes the new thesis. And then it finds a new antithesis. And then they wrestle. And then a new synthesis comes out. And that's the new. So the, the change of ideas, the change of beliefs, the change of you know, truth understandings and worldviews in our human uh, history is, could be modeled by this simple idea that thesis and antithesis wrestle and create a synthesis, and that then becomes the new winner temporarily until a new opponent shows up, and those wrestle, and on we go. So this is, you might say, this is a computer engineering example of, of Hegel in action. OK, arithmetic, we know. The idea here is that uh, if we keep it simple, if make all arithmetic operations have the form that the destination and two sources is how we do arithmetic. You keep it regular, that's going to keep it simple, and that's going to lead to higher performance at low cost. So here's some examples here. Add, there's the destination, there's two sources. There's the destination, there's two sources. Subtract, there's the destination, there's two sources. So destinations are left hands, sources are on the right. So if you turn this into this, you have to do that addition, do that addition, and then do that subtraction. Uh, notice that there's a little bit of Parenthesis around here, true MIPS code doesn't have G's and H's and I's and J's in it. True MIPS code has only register names, so these four and this are not really correct. But they show the relationship to F, G, H, I, and J in the original. Just pedagogy. So here's true MIPS code. Add S1 and S2 register values, put it in T0. Subtract S1, take S2, subtract S2 from S1, put the result in T0. Those are true MIPS instructions at the assembly language level. And the R format lets us do that. This says I have an R format instruction, the 0. This says which one it is. So 22 has a meaning, whichever one it is. I don't know, addition or subtraction. Actually, neither. It's something else. And then 17 is the code for the destination register. 18 is the code for the first source register. 8 is the code for the, no, I'm sorry. It's, excuse me, source, source, destination. So S1, S2's codes are 17 and 18. T0's code is 8. This is a shift amount field. We're not shifting, so just leave it blank. Okay? So there's a mapping between what you want to say in assembly language and the bits you're going to need in machine language. Okay? Does everybody understand that this is hexadecimal? So when we write 0, it means all these are 0. When we say 17, actually, it may be decimal. Uh, I mean, the value of the five bits here has to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. 18 has to be 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. 8, you know, et cetera. So you just map it into binary values. OK, there we go. Source 1, source 2, and destination. Op is that one. So there's where we put the op code. It's in two parts for the uh, R types. OK. Any questions about that? So we're mapping from the assembly language into how its format is going to be. Uh, MIPS uh, format has field names. We call this the op code field because it's a 6-bit field that tells us what's the operation going to be. 
source register, another source register, but can't have two named RS, so this one's RT, destination register, shift amount, and function. So if this op is zero, then there's many different functions. And so we find out which one it is by looking there. So add and subtract are both type zero, and then their function codes will be different to distinguish between them. So we've got six bit, then five, 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 and then another six. The grand total is 32 bits if you add it up. Any questions about this slide? Okay. All right. Um, now the operands are going to be register operands. We don't use memory operands. So all arithmetic instructions use register operands. What does that mean? The things that you're going to do with your arithmetic operation must be in register. They're not going to be in memory. They've got to be in register. Well, wait a minute. They're in memory. Then you bring them in with a load, and then they're in register, and now you can do the operation. That's the basic principle. We don't do operations on things far away in memory because things far away in memory are slow to get to, and things in register are near and fast. It would be as if I was going to throw something in this trash can or one way back there on the back row. Now, obviously, I'm going to miss unless I walk all the way back there and throw it in. It's going to take a long time. So I'm going to throw it into this trash can because it's close. Near resources are always faster than far away resources. That's the idea. So if you insist that your arithmetic instructions use register operands, they're going to be faster than if you allow memory operands. Because memory operands mean go to memory and get it, and that's going to take more time. OK. Um, there's a few things on here, but the main idea here is that um, if main memory is really big and has millions of locations, and the register file is small and only has 32 locations, which do you think is going to be faster, fetching register location 3 or memory location 3? Register, because it's smaller. Smaller is faster. I only got 32. The decoder is going to be smaller. Everything's going to be quicker about it than if I have 32 million and I pick out number 3 out of 32 million. The decoders have to be bigger. They have more levels. The gates have more inputs. It's going to be slower. It cannot be as fast, period. Bitty. I hope that's clear from what you know from digital design in CS223. Bigger is going to be slower. Smaller is going to be faster. If you didn't learn that, go back and learn it. Okay. Now, a register file is just a set of registers, and it's kind of like memory, but it's really tiny. Okay, so here's 32 registers, and how big are they? They're 32 bits each, and it allows us to give an address and get out the data. But it, this is a, called a two-port memory. It allows us to give two addresses and get out two data at the same time. You can read two at the same time. It's called a two-port memory. The memories that we showed are only one port so far. Give an address, get the data. This one, you give two addresses and you get two datas. Can you guess how they do that? Must have two multiplexers or two decoders, right? And they're doing things in parallel. So if you give address 3 and address 3 here, you know what? You get the data from register 3 here and the data from register 3 here also. Kind of silly, but you could get the same thing twice. Or you could give address 3 and address 29 here and get the data from register 3 here and the data from register 29 here. Called a two-port memory, in this case, two-port register file. You can also write to them, but there's only one write port. The destination address and the data you want to write. And then after a short time and with a clock, like including the write control signal, voila, this data will be written into the one that you told it. Now, these addresses, since there's only 32 of these, they only need to be five bits, don't they? From cipher, 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 cipher up to 11111, that's all you need to select which one of these 32. What if it wasn't 32? What if it was 32 million? How many address bits will you need then? Yanni. 32 mega instead of 32. How many address bits would you need then? 15. No. Remember? Oh, man. Mega equals 10 to the 6th, but we don't do anything in 10. We do powers of 2, 2 to the 20th. So therefore, 32 mega equals 2 to the 20th multiplied by 2 to the 5th equals 2 to the 25th. Yeah, 25 address bits, right? That's, that's the answer to that simple question. 25 address bits. So that's going to be a 25 to EQ Zeri 25, Kojaman, almost Inanomaz Kadarbuk, decoder. No thank you. That's ugly. So what are we going to do? Break it into two-dimensional decoding, have multi-levels of decoding, it sounds slow. It, no matter what you say, it sounds slow. 
a little 5 to 32 decoder is no big deal at all. There we go. There's a little 5 input, 32 output decoder. Which register do you want? Give the address of it here. One hot, the other's not. That one's turned on, the others are off. No problem. Okay, we can do that easily. But when it gets really big, it gets slow. So decoding memory, as you know, has its challenges. This is a little tiny memory. It's going to be very fast. Okay, 5 bit, 5 bit, 5 bit, 32 bit, 5 bit. Why, are this? Why is this 32? Why is this 32? Why is this 32? Because it's data. It's a 32 bit file. Why is this 555? Because it's an address. There's only 32 of them. We've talked that. Okay, so clear on this slide? Everybody okay? All right. So, registers are faster than main memory, but large register files are slower than little ones. In other words, small register files are going to be a little faster than big ones. If I go from 32 to 128 or 256, I slow it down. Yeah, so how big? Tiny? How about one? Oh, that's going to be really fast, but it's not got enough storage. So you're trying to get enough storage, but not be too big to slow it down. Because addressing uh, and getting your data in and out is going to be part of what you want to do in one clock cycle. If that's slow, your clock cycle has to stretch out and be slower. You're going to slow the machine down. Okay, But it's a lot easier for a compiler to um, have data here than it is to use it out of main memory. You can, a stack has order issues, and you can hold variables in, in your local storage and register. So compilers like to have the variables in register if you have enough of them. But if you only have eight registers, the compiler says, hey, I've got 16 active variables right now that you're working with in, in temporary calculations. Eight will be in the registers, and eight will be in memory, and you'll be doing a lot of load store. That's not good. You have to have enough to get the active set into register. All right, so here's an, op here's an example. Same, same thing, but this time we map FGHIJ into the S registers, so now everything is S's and T's. Can you see it here? Here's G and H, add them together, put it in a temporary. Here's I and J, add them together, put it in another temporary. Subtract the second temporary from the first temporary and put the result in S0, which is where we want F to be, so the result ends up in F. Any questions about that? How do we read these assembly language instructions? These two are operands, that's the result. These two are operands, that's the result. These two are operands, that's the result. What do I do with my operands? Add, add, subtract. Okay? We okay? Everybody all right on that? Any questions? You're reading a new computer programming language right here. Very soon you're going to be writing a new computer programming language. First read it, first learn to understand it, and then get comfortable, then you'll start writing some. Okay. So a little more on registers versus memory. We'll skip that. Immediate operands. What if I don't want to add two things in registers? I want to add a thing in a register and an immediate value. In other words, that's not register negative one. That's the value negative one. It's not in a register. It's in the instruction. Remember? We have the I format. I format says 16 bits of immediate. Yeah, honey, let's make it equal to minus one. Let's put the minus one right here. Okay. Who knows the binary value for minus 1? What, what am I going to write here? What's the binary value for minus 1? Right, right. Yeah, that's it. That's my minus 1. Now what am I doing with it? I want the code for S3 and S3 and the code for add immediate. So in my op field, whatever the code for add immediate is going to go there. And then I've got an RS and an RT field. And this is going to be the source, and this is going to be the destination in this case, because I don't have an RD. My destination is S3, so I need the code for S3 here, and my source is S3. I need the code for S3. I need that code, that code, that code, and 16 ones. And I am saying, add, yeah, be duck. <laughs> now it's four. What I'm saying is add four to S3 and put the result in S3. What is this? This is not add. It's add immediate. What does that mean? You don't get three registers. You get two registers and an immediate. There's your two registers. There's your immediate. So it's a different code. So the code for add immediate does not equal, oops, does not equal the code for add. What's the code for add? Zero with something down here on the other end. But we've already used that for immediate value. That's no longer the function field. This is a different format. This is the I format, not the R format. R format says, you got an op field and you got a function field together, you know what the operation is. No, 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 no. We're doing I now. The I format is you get one op field, that's it. You have to tell what the operation is there in those six bits. 
And then you get two registers and an immediate. Well, the two registers and the immediate are that, so that has to be totally defined by the code I put here. So I promise you, the code for ADDI is not going to be zero, because that's the code for the kind of instructions where you go down here and look and get the rest of the information. The R type. This is not R type. This is an I type, immediate. I have an immediate operand, and I have a register operand, and I do something with them and put it in my destination, which is S3. Okay. There is no subtract immediate instruction. So if I want to subtract 1, I just add negative 1. Pretty easy, isn't it? There's no need to have a subtract immediate instruction. OK, the design principle is to make the common case fast here. Small constants are very common. 50% of MIPS arithmetic instructions use small constants. Now, what do we mean by small constant? How big can this be? Yeah, well, I think you can see right away, with 16 bits, I'm going to be able to go from positive 2 to the 15th up to negative 2 to the 15th. That's my range. That's my 16 bits. If I get a number bigger than that positive or smaller than that negative, it will not fit here. We call those large constants. So which is more common? Small constants like 3, 4, 5, 10, 20, 64,000, 128, 512, numbers like that, or 28,256,569, which is more common? The small constants, obviously. So rarely there's a big constant. Frequently there's a small constant. Which one should I worry about making fast? The common case. Should I worry about making the rare case fast? Let it be slow. Let it be slow. Just as long as we can do it. Doesn't have to make it fast, because it's not a high probability high frequency occurrence, only the common case. If I make the common case slow, my overall performance is slow. If I make the common case fast and the rare case slow, I get overall good performance anyway, because it's rare. It doesn't hurt me. Okay? Let me see if I can make an example of that. Okay? The average weight of people in this room is probably somewhere around 70 kilograms. Add the boys, add the girls, add it all up. If one person that weighs 200 kilograms comes into this room, how much does the average weight in this room change? The answer is very little. Because there's already 50 people in the room whose average weight is 70 kilograms. So one 200, person kilogram, one 200 kilogram person is not going to change the average weight very much. Okay? Or another way to think of it is, to accommodate a 200 kilogram person, you need to give them a whole desk with a really large chair. Should we do that in this room in order to accommodate one? The answer is that will make every desk seat one student and it'll be very inefficient, won't it? The whole, you, half of you will be standing if we do that. There's not, it won't be enough seats, okay? Make the common case fast. Common case is a person about your size fits that chair. Got it? Okay, so that's the idea. All right, I think that's reasonable enough on that slide. Let's go on. Okay, um, we have a, such a common constant, zero, that we're gonna actually build it into hardware. Register zero is gonna have a permanent zero. So you'll just always be able to get a zero anytime you like out of, by using a certain register. And it's useful for common operations. Look what happens here. If I add S1 and 0 and put the result in T2, I didn't really do an addition. I did a move from S1 into T2. So this is a move, actually. Add with 0 is a way to move between registers without having to have a move instruction. We already have this instruction. So therefore, I can just do moves like that using my super frequent constant, which is the 0 constant. OK, uh, Typhoon probably talked to you about how the 32 MIPS registers are totally general purpose but they can be used for special purposes in what we call a software usage convention. Let's hear those words again. Software usage, yeah, you got that? Convention, on Lashma, okay? So this is an agreement for how to use the assembly language uh, for the MIPS processor. Every processor's assembly language has the following seemingly contradictory thing. You can use the registers any way you want, but we've all agreed to use them in this way. Please come cooperate with us. So you might say, yeah, wait a minute. Where's the freedom? You said I can use them any way I want. Then you took it away and you said, here's how we're all using them. Well, that's kind of like boys that play on the street and say, look, if you want to play in our game with our ball, please play by our rules. You can go play your own game with your own ball, any rules you like over there. But we're playing by a certain set of rules. You want to join us, play by our rules. That's how I would an analogize it. So software usage conventions say, if you want the code you've written, 
to be compatible with the code you've written, you both need to follow the convention. If you follow it and he doesn't, his code's not going to work with yours. If you f don't follow it and he does and everyone else does, your code's not going to work. So to be a part of a larger software development uh, enterprise, which most of you will go out and do, you need to follow the usage conventions for the software and the language and the tools that your company or your industry is using. We all have these. Yes, it's free, but we've constrained our freedom in order to be able to cooperate with each other. Okay? All right, that's the idea behind this. So, we've divided up the 32 registers into some groups. Here's the one that's constantly fixed at zero. This is called an assembler temporary, and you are asked as a programmer to please not use it. It's reserved for the assembler to use. So you don't write things into register one because it's agreed by convention that's saved for the assembler. In the same way, uh, no, they're not listed here. There's two that are reserved for the compiler as well. It's 26 and 27, which are not listed here. These are for return values from procedure calls, and these for argument values into procedure calls. So you give your arguments in A0 through A3, you get the return values in V0 and V1. Eight temporaries here and two more here. Those are temporaries. They're free. Saved values in these S registers, 16 to 23, have a special purpose. I'll go into that more later. We've got a register which is agreed to be the global pointer pointing to the global data area. We've got a register which is agreed to be the stack pointer pointing to top of stack. We've got a register agreed to be the frame pointer and a register agreed to be the return address pointer. Okay? So all those are uh, by convention. We'll get into that a lot more later. I just wanted to give you the idea that what's assumed to be completely free can be actually constrained by a common agreement called a software convention. Are there any questions about that? Okay, fine. So there you go. There's most of the 32 registers. And you notice they have a number like we were using before, but they also have a name. And you saw already a few times we used T's and S names, okay? And, and I think in the example, zero name was given. When you use the name, you put a dollar sign in front of it, okay? When you use the number, you put uh, a, a, a sign in front of it as well. Okay? well. We'll see conventions for how to actually do that. Um, all right, the load and store are as shown. What does load do? From memory into the register. So what does that mean? This thing comes into T0. What does store do? From the register back to memory. So that means this value goes to there. Everybody clear on that? Look at this. That's the normal way. Right side goes to destination. But this one's a little different. Because it's a store, it keeps the same format. But we all know that it's from register to memory. That means this is the source, and this is the destination. Right? Now, how can this rep I know how that represents a data value in register. It's very clear. Register T0 contains the value we're talking about. Please put this on top of the old value, and the new value will be in T0. This is very clear, too. What does this mean? How can that mean a memory word? Well, I think you can see that there's a register value, but it's in parentheses. That means the thing in S3 is not the data we're talking about. The thing in S3 is the address of the data we're talking about. Uh -huh. So it's a pointer. Using C terminology, it's a pointer. It's the address of the data we're talking about. OK, so that data's in memory, isn't it? OK, so if I have a 32-bit value and it's an address, if its lowest value is all zeros and its highest value is all ones, how big is the address space that it can point to? Let's ask ourselves that question. How big is the address space it can point to? Thirty-two bits can address how many individual different memory locations? Two. two to the thirty-two. Can someone say that in more understandable terms? Four giga items, words, bytes, we don't know yet, but four giga, four billion different items. Yeah, exactly. Four billion different items. Bytes or words or whatever they are. We haven't talked about that yet. Okay, good. So we see that the address space is four billion. From zero to four billion Chikar beer. That's the maximum number. Okay, that's good. Now, the only thing that remains is what's this little four doing here? What's this little eight doing here? And the answer is that number and that get added together. So this means go look in S3 and get 
most of the address, add four more to it. That's the real address. Go get the data and bring the data, which is that whatever that address is, and put it in T0. This one works just the opposite. Take the data in T0 and stick it into this address plus eight. So what did we do here? Can you see what we've done? We went and got something from one memory location, and we turned around and stuck it where? In the very next memory location. Not Well, I shouldn't say very next. A memory location for later. Now, if I tell you that these are bytes that are being addressed, almost all memory is byte addressable, then you'd say, oh, it gets something from one location and writes it in the very next instruction into a location four bytes later. How big is the thing that it gets? 32 bits worth of word from memory. How many bytes does 32 bits take in order to be in memory? No, a byte is 8 bits. How many bytes does 32 bits take? A byte is 8 bits. How many bytes does 32 bits take? A byte is 8 bits. <laughs> four bytes. Yeah, I got to keep saying it until you can divide 32 by 8 and get the answer 4. Good. So it needs four bytes. Ah! So from this location, which means that location and the next one and the next one and the next one, get four bytes, and that's a 32 bit thing and store it here, because that's a 32-bit thing. And then the next one says, take that same 32-bit thing and stick it into the location here, plus one more, plus one more, plus one more, because that's a four-byte location. So what did we do? Let's draw a little picture of it. Here's our memory. OK, so I'm going to have a register. I'm going to call the register S3. And the S3 has an address. And the address points to a location. Okay, great. So now, what does four parentheses S3 mean? Does it mean that location? No. It means plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. So this points to right here. And so when we say load word, what are we saying? We mean get that group of four and send it to where T0. So put it into T0. Great. And then we say, go get the thing in T0 and send it where? 8 plus the S3 value. The S3 value, nobody ever changed it. So 8 plus the S3 value points to where? Right there. So this is the value. This is the address. This is plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. This is plus 4. And plus 4, plus 5, plus 6, and plus 7 are the four bytes which make up the 32 bits that we went and got here and put here. So plus 8, plus 9, plus 10, and plus 11 are the next four bytes that are going to be where we put this on the store word. OK, now that's a lot. That's quite a lot of hardware and syntax and terminology. I better make sure everybody understands that. I better make sure everybody understands that. Okay? So let's go over it real slow. This means an address. This means a value at or in S3. But this means an address. So it means take that value and think of it as an address, not as a data value. Great. If that's an address, what's that? That's the address plus four more. Okay, so the address is a pointer to here, but four more is a pointer to here. That's a byte. That's a byte, that's a byte, that's a byte. Four bytes together make a 32-bit word. 32-bit words are what this architecture is all about. Get 32-bit words out of memory, put them in processor registers. Do things with 32-bit values in processor registers and create new 32-bit values. When you're all done, stick them back in 32-bit locations in memory, which really means four sequential 8-bit locations in memory. Byte, 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 byte together, you have a word. Hey, okay. So this is byte of memory, so this becomes a word of memory, and this becomes another word of memory. These four bit, four byte groups together are memory words. Are we, good? are we good? Are we okay? Ah, I got some questions. I thought there would be some questions about that. Okay, go. S3 is a register that contains a value, and that value is real important to us. It's the address of something in memory. It's in using C terminology, it's a pointer. S4 is a different register. S5 is a different register. I have no idea what's in there. I have no idea what's in there. It has no interest in me. I'm not interested in the value. Huh? What's the size of it? 
the size of S4, yeah. also 32 bits. Everything in this machine is a 32 bits. So this is a 32, all registers are 32 bits. So that means this is 32 bits. That means this is, they're all 32 bits. Let's go back and review that in case that didn't sink in. Okay, all registers are 32 bits. So that means the S3, the S4, the S5, all registers are 32 bits. So because this is a 32-bit address, I asked the question earlier, if it's all zeros, what memory location does it refer to? Oh, the lowest one is zero. If it's all ones, what memory location does it refer to? And somebody said 4 billion or 4 giga, right? So it's therefore addresses a memory space from lowest to highest, which is 4 gigabytes. Now, why did I say 4 gigabytes? Because 2 to the 32nd, exactly right, let's do the math. 2 to the 32nd equals 2 to the 30th times 2 to the 2nd. Everybody knows that's 4. I hope everybody knows that's giga. So 4 giga. 2 to the 30th is roughly 10 to the 9th power, giga, right? Kilo mega giga, don't forget that. 10 to the 3rd, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 9th. But when you're a computer engineer, it's 2 to the 10th, 2 to the 20th, and 2 to the 30th, right? Let's go one more. What's 2 to the 40th? Tera. You're starting to hear about terabytes, teraflops, tera. What power of 10 is that? 10 to the 12th power, yeah. 10 to the 12th power. Numbers that big are becoming common now in our discussion and our experience. All right, let's take a break. I think that's good. Take 10 minutes and then come back, and we'll continue the review when we get back.